like to thank Lauren for clearly being the only person who paid attention to the outfit memo that I sent out. It was clearly ignored by Michael and Drew and everyone else. It's good to be with y'all this morning. I'm grateful to be here. It's been a minute since I've had the chance to preach over here and to think with you a little bit in these moments about scripture and what God might be saying to us together today. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you're here. It's good to be with you. Like Michael said, we've started this series called Thank You Notes. And last week we thought about what it means for us to give thanks for the saints of our lives, the saints of the church and their legacies that they leave. And today we're going to think about what it means for us to give thanks for this day that we're currently living. So would you hear these words from Psalm 118? This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you have heard me preach or teach at all here ever, you've probably heard me talk about a guy named Walter Brueggemann. He's a Hebrew Bible scholar, and he's one of my favorite voices in all of biblical commentary. And he writes a lot about the Psalms. A lot of people write a lot about the Psalms, and there's a lot of opinions on how we should categorize them or classify them, but shocker to no one, I really like Brueggemann's. And he says there are three different types of Psalms. Orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. The Psalms of orientation are the ones, if you've read through the book of Psalms, that are about creation or about worshiping God in the temple or about the Torah, the law of God for the Israelites. They're about those things that ground us in the reality of God's order. Then there are Psalms of disorientation, which are those lament Psalms. If you've read the Psalms, you know there's a lot of those. It's those songs that are crying out from the perspective of the writer because their world has been turned upside down or something terrible has happened in the midst of their community, and they're crying out to God because they want to know why. And then finally, there are psalms of reorientation. And those are the ones that recognize that those things have happened that have changed our lives and that have made a huge impact and have turned our lives upside down, but they also recognize that God has brought us through them on the other side. So psalms of reorientation acknowledge the difficulties of life, but they give us a new perspective on the other side. And the psalm that we have this morning is a psalm of reorientation. Those few verses that we're focusing on this morning come in the middle of the psalm, and they're familiar to a lot of us, especially that last one. But in order to understand them more fully, I think we have to at least for a moment look at them in the context of the entire psalm to understand how they're framed in the midst of everything the psalmist is writing. So this psalm is based in the notion, the very simple but very profound notion, that God is good, that God's love is everlasting. And that's such an important concept in this psalm. It's reiterated over and over, and it actually begins and ends the psalm. The writer uses the exact same line at the beginning and the end, saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. The psalmist starts to talk about God's saving actions in the past. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. And then the writer looks forward to the future that he trusts that God will provide, saying, I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. And then from there, the psalm moves into this beautiful image of the psalmist and the priests and all the people gathered together, going and processing up to the altar, to the house of the Lord, this holy day and the celebration of what God has done, the celebration of God's goodness and God's steadfast love that we're all grounded in. And it's in the midst of that day of celebration that we hear those familiar words, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The psalmist has seen God's rescue. And in the song, she recalls the past and she expresses trust in the future, but above all, we see her resting in that present moment 
salvation. Something has happened in her life. We don't know what it is, but something's happened that causes her to say, I have seen God's salvation, and I trust that God will save again. And that allows me to give thanks for this moment right now. That gives me the security to give thanks for this day. One of the things that I love about the Psalms is that they are not prescriptive. They're not a book of rules. They're descriptive. So they don't tell us what to do, but they instead paint us a picture. They paint this broad picture of the range of human responses to God. So everything you can find in the book of Psalms from despair to anger to delight to thanksgiving, they invite us to experience God in these different ways, and they give us permission to experience God in all those different ways. So Psalm 118 paints a picture for us, and then it invites us to take from that picture what we will. So if we sit in a psalm, if we sit with it, if we pray it, if we let those words ring in our heads over and over again, rather than give us specific tasks or a specific work to do, I think that the psalm begins to do work in us and on us. As I've sat with this psalm in preparation for this week, as I've reflected on those words about salvation and giving thanks for this day and rejoicing in what God has made, they've begun to speak to me about the practice of being present where we are. Practice of being present where we are. This is an idea that I'm really good about preaching about to my friends and my colleagues. Drew and Michael can tell you how many times I have lovingly gotten on to them for getting so far ahead of where we actually are and planning and visioning for the future that they're not paying attention to where we are right now. And I'm like, you're not even enjoying what's happening in this moment around you. And I can assure you that they find this a very endearing quality and not at all an irritating one. <laughs> I have this group text with two of my best friends from seminary. And I texted them this week and uh, talking about this text. And I said, are you ever getting ready to preach or to teach something, and you're getting really deep in the text, and you're getting excited about it, and then you realize the reason you're so invested is because you're the one that needs to be convicted by it. And my friend Allison responded, it's so rude when Jesus gets all up in our business. <laughs> but that's how I feel about this text today, because the older I get, the busier I get, the harder it is for me to live in the present moment. The more I have on my plate, the easier it becomes for me to dwell in my head, either in the past or in the future. Either I'm focusing a lot of my energy on past regrets, on things I should have said or should not have said, on opportunities I miss to take action, or I'm thinking entirely about the future, and for me that looks like worry. We all worry, right? Think about the holidays and everything we have coming up. It's getting to that point of the year where things start to pile up and you don't know how you're going to get it all done. And you might have these different scenarios in your head that are competing, um, competing futures, and you're thinking, well, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? We even frame job interviews like this, right? Like, where do you see yourself in five years? What would you like to be doing in 10 years? Have you ever had someone ask you in a job interview, what do you love about your life today? Not likely. God has given us, as humans, these gifts of the ability to remember, to recall, and to learn from the past, and the gift of foresight, of being able to look forward and to vision and to plan, but sometimes we take those gifts and we use them to insulate ourselves from what's happening to us in the present because what's happening in the present can be painful, and it's easier to go somewhere else in our heads. I don't know about you, but when I look at my life and I look at my days, and I think about all the time that I've spent escaping in my mind to the past or to the future, I wonder how many moments of present salvation I've missed. How many glimpses of God's glory, and grace in the present have I not been present for? How many times has Jesus been standing right in front of me and I have failed 
to see him. It's good to look back on the past and to celebrate it and to learn from it, and it's good to vision and plan for the future, but when we begin to live too much in either of those places, it takes us away from where we are right now. And none of us have the luxury of that kind of time. I think that from the beginning, the early church understood these tendencies that we have as people. And so we find that there are ancient practices that have been handed down to us that are still in use today, that are intended to draw us back into the present, to draw us back into what God is doing at the moment. And one of these is walking the labyrinth. I don't know if any of you have ever done this before. I first encountered it in grad school. But from above, the general concept looks something like this. Just a path that you walk. So you would enter there at the bottom and make your way all the way around toward the middle and then back out. If you've ever been outside St. Paul's UMC in downtown Houston, you may have noticed they have this labyrinth built into the ground outside their sanctuary. It's kind of in the shadows there, but I think you can see it. And the idea is that they are a cathedral for the city, and this labyrinth is outside. It's available to all people at all hours, and so anyone can come, and anyone can take part in this practice of walking and meditating. If you go to some retreat centers, they may even have labyrinths built outside as well, or they might use rocks or flowers or different plants so that you can take part in this practice in the midst of creation. If you've been around our church for a while, you may know that we have a labyrinth mat that we roll out in the gym uh, one Sunday morning every month so that people can take a few moments of contemplation, a few moments of quiet, and they can walk that path and hear what God has to say to them. Walking the labyrinth is pretty simple. You just walk on the path. But one of the important pieces to realize is that it's not a maze. It's different than that. There aren't any dead ends. There aren't any wrong turns. You don't have to backtrack. Because there's one way in and one way out. And you simply follow it with your feet, and this allows your heart and your mind to center where your feet are. You can't really look back or ahead you saw all the ways that it twists and turns like this, right? Because if you do look back or ahead, you're not going to be able to follow the path. You're going to have to stop. Your attention has to be on your movement and your position right now. I think the people that came up with this were onto something. Barbara Brown Taylor is an Episcopal priest and a professor and an author, and she writes this about the labyrinth. Most of us spend so much time thinking about where we have been or where we're supposed to be going that we have a hard time recognizing where we actually are. When someone asks us where we want to be in our lives, the last thing that occurs to us is to look down at our feet and to say, here, I guess, since this is where I am. Maybe you don't walk a labyrinth, but you might walk your neighborhood. Maybe you run, or you kayak, or you fish. Maybe you paint, or you do yoga, or you cycle. I think it's so often these physical and these artistic practices that have the ability to bring us back to where we actually are and to help us to notice what's around us, to notice what God is doing around us. These two are the gifts of God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Not many of us spend a lot of time in the book of Ecclesiastes, but you may have heard these words from chapter 3 before, or if you know that song, Turn, 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 by the birds, it's basically the same thing. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And it goes on. The author is reminding us that there is a season for everything and that those seasons and those days are fleeting. We know, as we go through our days, that there's always another day on the way. There's always another time, another season on the way. And if we take that seriously, then we realize that every day is precious in its own right just because of what it is. You will never have this day again. Just ask somebody who's grieving. Ask somebody in hospice care. Ask someone who is 
sitting with their loved one in hospice care about the fleeting and the precious nature of our days. What's in front of us is all that we have. And to bring Ferris Bueller into it, if we don't stop and look around every once in a while, we could miss it. That passage from Ecclesiastes ends like this. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. In her book, Traveling Mercies, Anne Lamott ends a story by saying this. This is plenty of miracle for me to rest in now. Giving thanks for today doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be wordy. It doesn't have to involve words at all. It can simply be a noticing, an appreciation, an acknowledgement of the ground that our feet rest on right now. What if that were the framework of how we went about our days? I grew up taking dance classes several times a week with a girl named Kelsey. We're not very close anymore, but Kelsey was one of the most hilarious people I've ever known in my entire life. You knew that if you were with her, you were always going to have a great time. And we were really close in you know, late elementary, middle school, early high school. And we got involved in different stuff once we were in high school and kind of drifted apart, you know, went to different colleges, like you do with a lot of your hometown friends. But somewhere in that first year of college, my freshman year, I learned that Kelsey's dad had died. He was 51, and he was up in their attic doing some work on their house, and he had a heart attack and died. To say the least, it was a tragic event that shook their family and shook the community that I was from. I hadn't talked to Kelsey in a few years, but that weekend I went home, and I went to the service with my mom, and I remember hearing this story that has stuck with me for the decade that's followed that memorial service. They said that every day when his two daughters would come home from school or from work, that Brian would ask them, how was your day? And no matter what they would say, whether it was the best day they'd ever had or the worst day they'd ever had, whether they just couldn't wait to tell him about all the great things or whether all they did was complain, when they got to the end, he would say, you're alive, so today is the best day of your life. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is plenty of miracle for me to rest in now. Author and poet Annie Dillard writes, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Our lives are a compilation of days that the Lord has made. Psalmist writes, you have become my salvation. You have been and are now and are becoming my salvation every day. Every day is a piece of our salvation. Every day is a piece of our being made whole and renewed and healed into the image of God. Every day, no matter how wonderful or how terrible, holds a chance for us to grow and to learn and to change. And every day, we get to tap into that gift if we choose to. Every day, we can open up our souls and we can allow them to become aware of what God is already doing around and among us and through us. Every day, we can let ourselves be surprised. Every day, we can let ourselves be moved and broken down and rebuilt and transformed. Every day, we can let ourselves be saved. Or, every day, we can shut ourselves off, we can insulate ourselves and take refuge in our fear, our worry, our planning, our anticipation, or our regrets. We can let those things carry our minds far away from where our bodies are presently living. This is the day that the Lord has made. The more I reflect on the central concepts of our faith, the big ones like love and forgiveness and here thanksgiving, the more I realize that they're not feelings 
They're choices. They're choices that we make. Some days it's easy for us to choose to give thanks. The happy days, the easy days, the days that it's sunny and 70 degrees with a light breeze. And some days, giving thanks just for today feels like the furthest thing we could imagine because those are the days that no matter how hard we try, everything seems to turn to dust and to ashes in our hands. But this psalm, Psalm 118, that begins and ends with the proclamation that God's steadfast love endures forever, the psalm that declares that we are, from the beginning to the end of our lives and beyond, blanketed and surrounded by that love and steadfast grace. The psalmist sings to us that our circumstances are not the basis for our giving thanks. The basis for our giving thanks for this day is a God who has saved and is saving now and will continue to save. A God who's not done with creation and is not done with you and is not done with me. Thanks be to God. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If we can let ourselves believe that we're surrounded by that love on all sides, and if we can let ourselves believe that God is working here and now, then I think we'll be free. Free from fear, free from complacency, free from grasping, free from entitlement, free from worry about what tomorrow will bring. We'll be free to rejoice in this day, be free to awaken to what God is doing, and to give thanks for the ground on which we presently stand. Friends, may this day, may every day, be plenty of miracle for us to rest in now. Let us pray. Oh God, as we move closer to the end of this year, to those days that we know are filled with activity and remembering and anticipation, I ask that you would let the words of this psalm linger within us. I ask that you would lead us to glimpses of your salvation here and now, every day. For this day, for this time, we give you thanks. Amen.